This program is made possible in part by the Maryland Arts Council through the State of Maryland and the National Endowment for the Arts and the Howard County Arts Council through a grant from Howard County Government. Welcome to Hoko Polizzo's The Writing Life. I'm Elizabeth Spires, and our guest today is the poet Donald Hall, the former poet laureate of the United States, author of 15 books of poetry, 11 children's books, and various memoirs, essays, textbooks, and short stories. Welcome, Don. Thank you. Glad to be here. Um, I thought we might begin by talking a little bit about your background. You were born in Connecticut, an only child. Uh, your parents were great readers. Right. You went to Exeter and then Harvard. Um, the question always arises, were there people or situations in that childhood that you think led you to poetry? There were a whole lot. I, you don't want to hear all of them. But <laughs> the very first time was when I was uh, 12. And I liked to go to horror movies. Uh, Saturday afternoons, I would take the bus from Hamden, where I lived, into New Haven, and watch, um, you know, Abbott and Costello meet the Wolf Man, or Dracula, or whatever. And I was talking about this to a neighborhood boy, a couple of years older than me, and he said, well, if you like that sort of stuff, you ought to read Edgar Allan Poe. So I looked at Poe. My, my parents had a Book of the Month Club uh, dividend edition with the stories on one side and the poems on the other. And I, I read the poems, and I thought it was the best stuff I've ever read in my life. Uh, and I, uh, I wrote an Im imitation of Poe at first, until I was about 14. What was attracting you to Poe? Well, uh, the morbidity, probably, first of all, but also the sound. Mm -hmm. I, I pay a lot of attention to sound always, and it doesn't sound like Edgar Allan Poe. But at the beginning, I suppose it was broad enough uh, to make an impression even on a 12-year-old. So the sensibility, that morbid sensibility that fits in a little bit with where you are as an adolescent, <laughs> I don't know. And I think it's continued pretty much. Uh, uh -huh. to uh -huh. Well, you went on um, after Exeter, which um, when I was reading your memoir, Unpacking the Boxes, I'm not sure that was a happy, the happiest time in no, your life. No, it wasn't. Uh, but it sounded like Harvard was much better. And Harvard, yeah, yeah. At Harvard, I came home. It was the first time I felt at home with my own generation. Even as a kid, I stayed a lot of time alone. I actually went to public high school for two years, uh, which was pretty desolate. But then I went two years to Exeter, where it was you know, 500 males in the wilderness and uh, very few poets. And of course, I was already announcing myself as a poet. But when I got to Harvard, uh, I remember freshman year, right at the beginning, a whole bunch of us gathering in one room, and somebody, probably me, brought up poetry. And nobody who hawed, uh, and everybody quoted something of a poem that he was always, it was all he at that time, had known. And it, you know, it might be some silly poem or whatever, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, I was amazed. And then I met uh, the poets who were already at Harvard. Uh, none of us knew we'd ever publish a book, you know, but there was Adrian Rich and uh, Kenneth Koch, John Ashbery, Frank O'Hara, Robert Bly. Uh, it was extraordinary. And we, we, we got to know each other, which isn't to say that we agreed with each other about things. We argued a lot, and we competed a lot. Bly and I were dearest friends, uh, and it began then. And uh, but otherwise, we took ourselves very seriously, and you know, so seriously, it, we'd be easy to mock. Mm -hmm. But that seriousness, that argument, argument going on about what is a poem? Is this poem any good? And so on. That was wonderful. Uh, it was and a wonderful did, introduction. Did you all f um, value each other's work then? I mean, you said no. you took it seriously, and you were so we, different even then, I think, well, as poets. We, we valued, valued each other very differently. Uh, and 
published, we, we were together, most of us, on the Harvard Advocate, which was the literary magazine. And we printed uh, ourselves and other people in various styles. But we would argue maybe until two or three in the morning over whether something was worthy of our magazine, which is you know, pompous, I suppose, and so on. But the, the argument, the contention, even the competition, I think was enormously valuable to the rest of our lives. The seriousness that you took poetry, I don't think, I wouldn't think it's necessarily pompous, but it was something that, as you said, carried over into later in your life. Yep. Yep. And you went on after, I mean, I'm skipping ahead, because sure. you were at Oxford and you were taught at Michigan, University right. of Michigan. And at a certain point, you decided to leave Michigan to um, go back to your um, grandparents' farm, where you still live, yeah. and um, with your um, wife, Jane Kenyon. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, your marriage to Jane Kenyon. I know a lot of poems came out of um, the fact that, you know, you, the illness and um, her death. Yeah. And um, I mean, living with another poet, were you showing each other your work? Were you um, um, sometimes keeping it secret or separate? Well, we had a kind of method. Uh, we wouldn't write anything and run to show it to the other. Uh, we would work on it, not in secret, but in, in, in a separate solitude uh, alone. And then every now and then Jane would come to me. She called me Perkins, by the way. And she would say, uh, Perkins, I left some stuff on your desk. Or I would say, uh, God, Jane, there's some stuff on your footstool. Then I'd run away. <laughs> uh, and uh, Jane said that I always came to her after reading three poems that she'd been saving up. I always said, hmm, these are going to be good. And she'd say, going to be, huh? <laughs> and I would go through them. And Jane always said, too, I would uh, leave Perkins and go up to my room uh, thinking he doesn't get it. And then I'd do everything he said. That was never true either, but we each did, uh, we each helped each other a lot mm -hmm. and made changes because of what the other said. And later, b both of us would show poems to other people too for their responses and their help. But we, uh, there had to be a kind of competition uh, between us, but we were very careful in lots of ways not to. Um, let, let us affect each other personally. Some days, you know, we'd both get a letter from a magazine. One would be accepted and one would be rejected. But the main difference then was the one who was accepted couldn't feel too happy about it mm -hmm. because the other one had been rejected. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, that in itself is competitive, but it's, it's not argumentative and you know, it's not unpleasant. Well, it sounds to me as if. Um you were showing each other poems that were, for the most part, finished. I mean, close. it wasn't like that you were working together on them draft by draft, no, no. close. And then it was up to the other person whether to take the advice or right. to remain right. obstinate, which can be a good thing. Sure, Obstinacy sure. can be. There, there were particular habits that I had and particular habits that he had, that she had, which each, each of us was automatically against. I mean, I could tell you what, but mm -hmm. trivial things. And we, so we would sort of um, um, dismiss uh, an objection to that particular thing. It was always going to be there. We knew it. Writing, we knew it. Uh, but, uh, oh heavens, I mean, practically every poem that either of us wrote and showed each other, the other has put a mark on it. I wondered, um, in 1994, I'm, I think that's the year yep. um, Jane um, had leukemia, and that yes. was a kind of 15-month struggle until right. her death. She died in 95. Yeah. I wondered if you would um, like to read a poem that came out of that particular time in your life. Well, uh, did you have a poem in mind? Uh, I have poems of the illness and then of poems of grief. Uh, would you like to read one of the illness and, d and the, the ship pounding with that? Oh, that's a lovely poem. Okay? I love that poem. Now I have to dig in my book. Here we go. Uh, the ship pounding and the um, the ship is the hospital where she is all day, and where I spend almost all day with her. The ship pounding. 
Each morning I made my way among gangways, elevators, and nurses' pods to Jane's room to interrogate the grave helpers who tended her through the night while the ship's massive engines kept its propellers turning. Week after week, I sat by her bed with black coffee and the globe. The passengers on this voyage wore masks or cannulae or dangled devices that dripped chemicals into their wrists. I believed that the ship traveled to a harbor of breakfast, work, and love. I wrote, when the infusions are infused entirely, bone marrow restored, and lymphoblasts remitted, I will take my wife, bald as Michael John Jordan, back to our dog and day. Today, months later at home, these words turned up on my desk as I listened in case Jane called for help or spoke in delirium ready to make the agitated drive to emergency again for readmission to the huge vessel that heaves water month after month without leaving port, without moving a knot, without arrival or destination, its great engines pounding. I think that is such an incredible extended metaphor of the hospitalist ship and it, I mean I was thinking about that when I was coming over here today and just the whole sense of that hospital is going 24 hours a day there's never a pause. Yeah, yes. And, and going nowhere. <laughs> going nowhere yeah. and, and it's also this sense of uh, lim a limbo like quality in it. It's not really your real life yeah, but yeah, it is yeah. I guess. It's become so absolutely yes. Mm -hmm. It was the only life there was during the 15 months of leukemia. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, there are so many, uh, you wrote so many beautiful poems about that, I mean grief-stricken poems, but yes. very moving poems. And um, um, I want, I'd like to hear another if you uh, want to read, well I'm not sure, what, what the weeds and peonies or the wish, what, what would be good? The, uh, <laughs> I don't know, but <laughs> weeds and peonies happens to be the uh, first one that I started about a month after her death. Uh, she was a great gardener and um, she died in April so that the flowers were coming up and they kept coming up and it was her garden. Uh, weeds and peonies. Your peonies burst out white as snow squalls with red flecks at their shaggy centers in your border of prodigies by the porch. I carry one magnanimous blossom indoors and float it in a glass bowl, as you used to do. Ordinary pleasures, contentment recollected, blow like snow into the abandoned garden, overcoming the daisies. Your blue coat vanishes down Pond Road into imagined snowflakes, with gusts at your side, his great tail swinging but you will not reappear, tired and satisfied, and grease repeated particles suffuse the air, like the dog yipping through the entire night, or the cat stretching awake, then curling as if to dream of her mother's milky nipples. A raccoon dislodged a geranium from its pot. Flowers, roots, and dirt lay upended in the back garden where lilies began their daily excursions above stone walls in the season of old roses. I pace beside weeds and snowy peonies, staring at Mount Cusarge, where you climbed wearing purple hiking boots. Hurry back, be careful climbing down. Your peonies lean their vast heads westward as if they might topple, some topple. You spoke at the reading you gave yesterday of, um, a, that was such a difficult time, and you spoke about having these two hours in the morning when you were writing poems, these poems of um, farewell and grief. Um, can you talk a little bit about that process? Yes, yes. I was, uh, I, I wrote a whole series of letters to her, which uh, comprise the second half of a book 
about her illness and death. And every day I would work on these letters and I would add a new one. So I was working over stuff I'd worked on for months and then beginning new things. And it was the only happy time in my day. It was as if I was doing something about it. I was addressing her. I was trying to make as good a poem as I could. I was thinking then not only about my loss, but about what we had in common, poetry, trying to, to make a good poem. And after I worked about two hours, uh, I knew I had 22 hours of um, loneliness and mourning ahead of me until I could get back to the desk and work on these poems. The poems are full of uh, grief and some horror, but it was not grief and horror to write them. It was um, making them into poems, making grief and horror into poems. Well, and I was wondering, since some of them were cast as letters, if it was almost as if a phone call, only a one-way phone call, in terms of a real connection with the person, right. even right. though they weren't... Um, that was especially true with the letters, as you say. Uh, I could talk to her about, as, as it were, <laughs> talk to her about things that had just happened that she would be interested in. And uh, no, the first one was called Letter With No Address. And I never thought I was talking to her directly. But it was as if, which was, I suppose, uh, among other things, a kind of comfort to be addressing her, among the other things which I mentioned uh, in the act. I think lots of people have written letters to dead loved ones. I once found a packet of letters uh, in Ann Arbor when I lived there, written by someone to her boyfriend who had died in the plane crash. And at that time I was young and I thought, well, why write letters to somebody dead? <laughs> and then I was doing it and I knew why. Finally you understand I enough understood years all that. passed. Yeah. Well, there's a poem, I think it's at the end of Without, it's called The Wish. And I think it, uh, even though you can't ever really totally end the grieving process, I think it, it's a kind of closure to, a certain, to this period in your life. Yes, it, it, it was, uh, I knew that's what I was doing when I wrote it. I, d I didn't uh, have a notion ahead of time, I am going to uh, uh, change where I am. But I, I listened to my own poem and heard it, The Wish. I keep her weary ghost inside me. Oh, let me go, I hear her crying. Deep in your dark you want to hide me and so perpetuate my dying. I can't undo the grief that you weep by the stone where I am lying. Oh, let me go. By work and women half distracted, I endure the day and sleep at night to watch her dying reenacted when the cold dawn descends like twilight. How can I let this dream forget her white withdrawal from my sight and let her go. Her body, as I watch, grows smaller. Her face recedes, her kiss is colder. Watching her disappear, I call her, come back as I grow old and older. While somewhere deep in the catch of sleep, I hear her cry as I reach to hold her. Oh, let me go. I heard you talking about this poem where you acknowledge a debt to Thomas Hardy because of the stanza structure, and I also thought a bit of Yeats. And I mean, it's as if yeah, you're reaching yeah. into the ba past to to um, yeah, retrieve yeah, this poem. Yeah. The stanzas and the refrain, mm -hmm. oh, let me go. This uh, Yeats was my uh, favorite poet for decades, and guess who replaced him? <laughs> Thomas Hardy. The poetry of Thomas Hardy is just magnificent. And of course, I mean, his marriage with his first wife was very different from my marriage to Jane. But after she died, he wrote maybe his best poems uh, in grief and somewhat in guilt uh, over the badness of their marriage. But uh, they were very beautiful, beautiful poems. Mm -hmm. And they were written in stanzas with the rhyme. And in stanzas of varying, where the lines are varying in length and so on. And I followed this sound or this organization of sound. Not the uh, 
diction, not the kind of language, but the shape. No, it's totally. It's it feels very contemporary, very colloquial, uh, but um, but with that form from the past. That yep. and, and the poem I think couldn't exist without the refrain. The simple, beautiful refrain is so powerful. Um, I'd like to shift just a bit because I'm interested too in your writing for children. Oh yeah. And mm -hmm. you've written um, eleven children's books. Uh, I have this one. Ox. Everybody knows this book, Ox Cart Man, which I'm glad to say. won the Caldecott Award and was illustrated by Barbara Cooney. Now that started out as a poem um, that you modified to some extent yeah, into yeah. the text for the, for the children's yeah. book. A cousin of mine told me this story. It was a story passed on from generation to generation. He told me that when he was a boy, he heard it from an old man, and the old man had heard it when he was a boy. It's one of those, it's a folk tale. And it was, it began, did you ever hear the one about the fellow from here, from around here, who loaded his ox cart every fall? And it went on to selling the ox. Uh, and on, the minute I heard that story from my cousin, there were chills up and down my spine. Oh, really? And the, the next morning, I began to write the poem. I did not think of it as a children's book. And over about a year, I struggled to finish that poem. And about the time I sold it to a magazine, my daughter was visiting, but she was 18 or so. Uh, I suddenly had the idea that the same story modified for uh, children or changed uh, might make a children's book. So I went out and wrote a draft of it very rapidly. Then I had to read some reference books to find out uh, what the Art Man would bring back to his kids mm -hmm. as presents and so on. But the whole thing was amazingly quick. I, I take forever normally to write anything, uh, but that one uh, was quick. And I had the great fortune of having Barbara Cooney illustrated it. And the call to God, of course, goes to the illust 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 illustrator, basically. <laughs> uh, I sh share the honor, and I share the royalties, which has been wonderful. It, it paid the mortgage. Uh, Jane and I actually wanted a new bathroom, but were unable to pay for it. And we did it then, and over the new bathroom, I have the Caldecott Room. I Financed. shouldn't call it the Oxcart Room. Right? Financed by the Oxcart or the Caldecott Award. Right. Is it, um, I, don't, I don't know whether you have a favorite, is it your favorite of your 11 children's books? I, I would like to read some of the ones that are not as easy to obtain. One, there's, uh, oh, there's one called uh, when, when Willard Met Babe Ruth. Uh, which is written more in paragraphs. It's not young adult, but it's in between. And I really liked that one. I had to search to make it up. Maybe I am preferring it because it was harder to do. But I don't know as I really prefer it to Oxcart Man. There's another called Dog and Cat, which is still around. Dog, dogged Cat? Dog and Dog Cat. Dog and Cat. Dogged yeah. Cat, though, would be good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a dialogue between a dog and cat. And it makes people laugh, even mm -hmm. grown-ups, but uh, especially kids. When you were writing, some, the, not necessarily Oxcart Man, but on some of these others, did you write with a child in mind or one of your children in mind? I, I wrote my very first, which didn't work, when my eldest child was about four years old, and it definitely came out of him. And I noticed uh, belatedly that most of my children's books uh, were written after my grandchildren were born. And I didn't consciously write to them. I dedicated books to them, and I read them aloud, as my parents did. But uh, I, I'm sure that the birth of grandchildren woke up an interest in addressing children. I, I definitely feel that's true, that um, just raising my daughter, that um, when she was young, there were these ideas coming out of our interactions yeah. and just her, from her being there that, um, you know, it's almost like you need to rent a child so that you can keep yeah. getting these yeah. ideas yeah. for children's books. My, my four-year-old actually gave me the idea for my first uh, unsuccessful children's book. He, he said he was going to do something scary, go to the lion store, buy a lion seed, and grow it in a flower pot. And I ran off to my Pen and paper. <laughs> and that, but that, that did get published, right? Did that you say it was, it was published, un yes. unsuccessful? It, it was published, but not oh. many people bought it. Right. Um, yeah. um, 
are you going to write any more? I, I, for some reason, I haven't been able to since uh, Jane died. I've tried. There are two or three I tried. One seemed to be kind of close, but uh, oh, I tried it on a couple of editors, really knowing that it, that it didn't work, and uh, they agreed. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know what the connection could be between Jane's death and me being unable to write them. I have a, I hope it's not an unfair question. I, it's a question I ask my students sometimes when the semester begins. But I wondered, um, do you have a definition for poetry? I've compiled so many definitions over the years. Robert Frost said, beautiful enthusiasm brought under artistic control. I thought that was a good mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know if it was something you'd ever tried to define for yourself or not. No, I have, but I'm going to give you two answers. Um, one is that uh, for me, maybe beginning with Poe, sound has always been the entryway. And any time my style has changed over many, many years, it started by way, the, by way of the noise that the poem makes, which varies a great deal. And the sound seems to lead me by the nose. So sound is so important. But otherwise, something I've always said, that every poem, to be any good, has to have its own opposition built into it. it, it this ambivalence, which is a characteristic of every human mind, whether we're aware of it or not, is characteristic of every decent or good poem. Uh, it has to be there. I, uh, uh, I have occasionally uh, gone back to a poem and uh, tried to think of what feelings I had that were opposed to what I say, and sometimes found them there, or sometimes revised to add them. I, I believe a poem needs to be some, something with tension. Current, with, with, with the tension, it doesn't have to be 50 50. It just means there has to be some trace of a foreign element. Uh. Do you have, we're getting near to the end, but are, do you have any advice for the poets c coming up? Um, something they should keep in mind when they're starting out to, to keep them on track? Okay, yeah. There are two pieces of advice that I always give. Um, one of which is uh, uh, to expect to work over a poem, to revise it. Uh, many very young people think there's something insincere about revising because the first draft was sincere. And that's to think about yourself, not about the poem. Uh, I'm, there are some poets who've written good poems with very little revision. Most of the poets I know whom I admire have spent uh, a great deal of time going over their poems before publishing them. Uh, one problem is the workshop that meets once a week and you should bring something to it. Ah, it's deadly. Seems deadly. The other thing is read the old poets. So many of the young poets I know uh, seem to think poetry may have begun in 1984 mm -hmm. or something. But one problem with that is to read Milton, Shakespeare, Chaucer, to read the great poets of the 17th century, I mean, George Herbert, John Donne, Andrew Marvel. Uh, you need to have a mind or an ear that can receive the meter. And you just aren't born with that. You get it, in fact, by reading the old poets. But if you haven't read the old poets and you try to read them for the first time, you ha have no sense of their music. And therefore, you have no, no s real sense of how they hold together, how they finish themselves. So cultivating the ear. Cultivating the ear, mm -hmm. one way or another. Thank you so much for joining us today. I've had a good time talking with you. Um, and thank you for joining us on Hoko Polizzo's The Writing Life. <laughs>
Thank you.